Did you know that many of the things we believe about ADHD are actually myths? You've probably heard someone say, oh, they must have ADHD because they're so outgoing, or seen someone dismissed as just being badly behaved. But one in 10 children worldwide is diagnosed with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Today, we're going to debunk some of these common misconceptions and reveal the facts. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's a chronic condition that includes attention difficulty, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness. Recognized by major health organizations like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and the World Health Organization, WHO, ADHD involves differences in brain development and activity, affecting attention and self-control. ADHD affects both children and adults, leading to significant challenges in school, work, and relationships. Imagine a child struggling to focus in class despite their best efforts. ADHD makes everyday tasks a challenge. Understanding ADHD is the first step towards empathy and effective management. Have you ever wondered if what you know about ADHD is truly accurate? Share your thoughts as we uncover the facts together on Protium. ADHD is a well-documented medical condition recognized by major health organizations like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and the World Health Organization, WHO. It involves differences in brain development and activity that affect attention, the ability to sit still, and self-control. According to the CDC, about 6.1 million children in the United States have been diagnosed with ADHD. A study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry found that ADHD is not just a childhood disorder, it can continue into adulthood. Approximately 4.4% of adults in the US have ADHD. This neurodevelopmental disorder has a strong genetic component with research showing that about 74% of ADHD cases are inherited. Contrary to the myth that ADHD is just an excuse for bad behavior, it is a legitimate disorder with clear diagnostic criteria outlined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. What sort of reasonable adjustments could people generally ask for in this, in this current climate of the workplace? Work coaches are very popular. More time, like mm -hmm. time to process, which I found actually helps a lot of people. That time. Very much so about, it's kind of funny you say that because I go into my own deficits thinking of things I can't do and I haven't been able to get right. So note that we all are human. But I think one of the bigger ones would be like a workplace advocate asking for more clear and concise language. One of the number one things I say in an IEP, use clear mm -hmm. and concise language. You know, if you want to have a meeting, who does the meeting go to? You know, like who is invited to said meeting? Having lists is something else a lot of workplaces have been doing. And that is actually Ali, Jessica, and all of them who have taught me that one where it's like, they just are like, be specific, right? Who do they need to speak to for this problem? Who needs yeah. to happen? And, you know, because one of the bigger issues that's happened is like, you know, autistics were kind of black and white. And so mm -hmm. we're, this is your management. This is your supervisor. Go to them for everything. Yeah. And then we go to them for everything and get in trouble for it. So yeah. it's kind of like, give us a clear list. Okay, if you're having payment issues, go here. Just if email me anytime you need help. Like, emails and then they get angry once when you do. Hour, like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my own boss is funny because she was like, she just, I was like, can I get a list of like what I need done? And she was like, okay, <laughs> still hasn't done it. <laughs> but it was one of those, you know, she started texting me like, okay, this person, this person has issues come up. But, you know, I was like, a list would have been helpful. So I still haven't gotten my own list. But it's something I think that's a reasonable thing to ask people. Hey, give me exactly who I need to talk to for what situation. And it's a very, it depends on the business, too. Like, there are some businesses that are very open to whether or not it be in education, like all the different sectors, right? Like, that are open to this feedback of, like, yeah. help me. Others are not. And so I always tell people, you feel like your boss you're, is not listening. You might need to go. And I know it's cruel as someone who, you know, has had to leave with quite a the few ideal, jobs now. The idea deal would be all the you know the accommodations are made and they say that but it's you not know, up to them so and exactly and so i found that like even in certain businesses where people wanted to accommodate the hrs wouldn't allow them hence the charters you know mm. so i think that it's important to kind of know your limits too right like so if you ask for your reasonable accommodation you ask like you're trying to be proactive you're not saying screw you you didn't do your job i'm miserable dsm5 the DSM-5 criteria help clinicians diagnose ADHD accurately, ensuring that individuals receive appropriate treatment and support. ADHD can have a significant impact on various aspects of life, including academic performance, work, 
and relationships. It's essential to understand that ADHD is not about a lack of effort or willpower. People with ADHD often have to work much harder to achieve the same results as those without the condition. Treatment options include medication, behavioral therapy, and lifestyle changes, all of which can help manage symptoms effectively. Understanding and supporting those with ADHD is crucial for helping them lead successful and fulfilling lives. By debunking myths and spreading awareness, we can create a more inclusive and empathetic society for everyone affected by ADHD. It's quiz time. Let's see how much you know about historical treatment. Which unusual treatment was historically used for managing symptoms similar to ADHD before modern understanding? A. Lobotomy, a surgical procedure that involves severing connections in the brain's prefrontal lobe. B. Bloodletting, the practice of withdrawing blood from a patient. C. Leech therapy, the use of leeches to draw blood. D. Cold water immersion, submerging a person in cold water. Stay tuned to find out the correct answer later in the video. A common myth is that ADHD is something only children have. However, ADHD can continue into adulthood. According to a study by the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, approximately 4.4% of adults in the United States have ADHD. Many adults are diagnosed later in life, often after their children are diagnosed, which leads them to recognize similar symptoms in themselves. Adult ADHD symptoms can differ from those in children. I said, I got diagnosed, I said, I have uh, ADHD. And he kind of laughed at first. He goes, what? He goes, that's for kids. I'm like, oh. I said, it's not necessarily just for kids. So I said, uh, I said, I have it. I think a lot of people have this misconception that ADHD is just something that younger boys get diagnosed with that are hyper that run around the room. That is not the case at all. Because I don't think most people realize that it does exist in adults and it does exist in females. Um, it's just very different the way it presents itself. When I did get diagnosed with it and then I did look back at my childhood and you know I was always getting in trouble at school and not really meaning not being malicious but just you know being Rambunctious, basically, right? School is just always, always very, very difficult. Getting, getting assignments in, uh, doing just the day-to-day -day, um, route stuff was just very, very difficult. I was always distracted in class. I was diagnosed three years ago. Started seeing signs of a lot of anxiety. Uh, it affected my everyday life. Back in my work, uh, my relationship with my wife, my family. So along with the ADHD and the anxiety, I, I do sometimes experience depression. And sometimes, um, sometimes it gets to be quite deep depression. There's absolutely a connection between that anxiety and the ADHD in that not only do they happen to coincide more often, but the anxiety makes the ADHD symptoms quite a bit worse. A lot of people with ADHD, they want to do well. It's not because they're lazy. It's not because they don't want to try. It's just they need that extra time. They need to be away. Another thing I really wish that people understood is that motivation is a neurological thing. It's not a personality thing. It's not a if you really want to thing. Um, so for people with ADHD, if they're under just enough pressure, not so much that they shut down, but not too little that it's not important, then that motivates them. That actually changes the way the brain is functioning. It releases chemicals in the brain that help them focus. I, I, I found uh, knowing uh, makes it, has made it easier for me to manage it. Um, it's very difficult to manage something when you don't know what it is that you're trying to manage. The fact that in Ontario, in Canada, there are so many ministries that don't recognize ADHD as a disability is enormously harmful. It's harmful to me as a person who grew up so impaired, and it's harmful to me as a parent, and it's harmful to my children because they have to constantly justify every little thing that they do wrong, and they're told it's an excuse. I wish that people knew more about ADHD, and I, would, I feel that there's definitely a stigma associated with it, um, and I feel that if they had more knowledge, um, that they, they wouldn't be as judgmental. Let's get the conversation going. Let's continue it. And I think if more people start talking about it, it'll become more natural and people don't need to feel ashamed to talk about it. While children may exhibit hyperactivity, adults are more likely to experience restlessness, difficulty in organizing tasks, and challenges in managing time. This can affect their performance at work, relationships, and daily activities. 
It is essential to understand that ADHD is a lifelong condition that can be managed with appropriate treatment and support. Dr. Russell Barkley, a leading ADHD researcher, states, ADHD is one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorders, and it does not simply disappear after childhood. Adults with ADHD often develop coping strategies to manage their symptoms, but many continue to struggle without proper diagnosis and treatment. This highlights the importance of recognizing and addressing ADHD in adults to improve their quality of life. If you or someone you know struggles with symptoms of ADHD, it is important to seek professional help. Proper diagnosis and treatment can make a significant difference. Treatment options for adults include medication, behavioral therapy, and organizational tools to help manage daily tasks. Hi, I'm Mark Ruffalo, and um, I was undiagnosed with um, dyslexia, ADHD, and uh, depression uh, in my youth. And uh, one of the things I always was very difficult for me was grade school, feeling uh, strange and unique and freakish. Um, didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And uh, I would say to my older self now and my younger self then that, uh, you know, there's help and that there are ways to, to deal with it and to manage it and to overcome it. Understanding and addressing ADHD in adults is crucial for their well-being and success. ADHD is recognized worldwide, but its perception and impact can vary greatly depending on cultural, social, and economic factors. Diagnostic criteria and awareness levels differ from country to country. In many high-income countries like the United States and the UK, there is greater awareness and more standardized diagnostic criteria. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, approximately 9.4% of children in the US have been diagnosed with ADHD. In contrast, in many low-income countries, limited access to healthcare professionals trained in ADHD diagnosis results in lower diagnosis rates. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a study published in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Mental Health found that only about 0.5% to 2% of children are diagnosed with ADHD, reflecting significant gaps in diagnosis and awareness. Cultural attitudes towards mental health also significantly impact the recognition and treatment of ADHD. In India, Dr. Ajit Pidi, president of the Indian Psychiatric Society, notes that ADHD is often underdiagnosed due to cultural stigma and lack of awareness. A study in the Indian Journal of Psychiatry reported that only 1% to 2% of children are diagnosed with ADHD, likely an underestimation due to these factors. Behavioral symptoms of ADHD can be perceived differently across cultures, for instance, in Japan. ADHD symptoms may be interpreted as a lack of discipline rather than a medical condition, leading to underdiagnosis and minimal treatment options. Support systems and treatments also vary globally. In high-income countries, a combination of medication and behavioral therapies is commonly used. The National Institute of Mental Health NIMH, reports that about 70-80% of children with ADHD in the U.S. respond well to stimulant medications. Conversely, in low-income countries, traditional or community-based support may play a larger role due to limited access to medication and formal therapies. Understanding these global differences is crucial for developing effective support systems for those with ADHD worldwide. What? Hi, I'm Zoe Saldana, and I was undiagnosed actually with uh, dyslexia and ADHD and there, were, there was actually a moment where my mother was encouraged by medical practitioners and teachers to, to medicate me and, um, and, she, and she didn't. She just got me to be really busy and kept me entertained, encouraged me and nurtured whatever it was that I was curious about and if there's something that my older self would tell my younger self is rely on those people that really believe in you and are really willing to genuinely listen to you. It does get better but please speak up, don't live in silence because who you are and what you do and what you're going through is not wrong and you need help and sometimes there is somebody around you that can help you but if you use your voice and you speak up then they know whether it's a teacher, a friend, a parent, a hotline, a website, speak up because you deserve, you deserve to be heard. A persistent myth about ADHD is that it is caused by poor parenting. 
This misconception suggests that children with ADHD are simply the result of bad parenting practices or a lack of discipline. However, research has shown that ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder with genetic and biological factors. It is not caused by how a child is raised. Studies indicate that ADHD is highly heritable. According to a report by the National Institute of Mental Health and NIM, about 74% of ADHD cases are attributed to genetic factors. This means that if a parent has ADHD, there is a significant chance that their child may also have the condition. Environmental factors, such as exposure to tobacco smoke during pregnancy or lead exposure, can also contribute to the development of ADHD, but they are not the primary cause. Dr. Russell Barkley, a leading ADHD researcher, emphasizes, ADHD is not a result of poor parenting. While parenting practices can influence how symptoms are managed, they do not cause the disorder. This highlights the importance of distinguishing between the management of symptoms and the root causes of ADHD. Proper understanding of ADHD can help parents provide better support for their children without feeling undue blame. It is crucial to move away from blaming parents and instead focus on providing appropriate support and treatment for children with ADHD. Effective management strategies include behavioral therapy, educational support, and medication when necessary. By debunking this myth, we can create a more supportive environment for families affected by ADHD and ensure that children receive the help they need to thrive. Hi, I'm McKenna Hellum. I am a model and I have anxiety, depression, and ADHD. I can't really remember not ever having these things. I've had it since I was a little kid. So what I would tell my younger self is that your mental illness isn't all of you. You are not your mental illness. It's only a part of you. And as you grow older, you're gonna find ways that are gonna help you cope and manage this. My advice to people in a similar situation would to be patient and not be so hard on yourself. Finding the right medication or method or doctor all takes time. It's all about trial and error to see which work, what works for you. You know, one thing may work for someone, but it might not work for you and that's okay. Just know that there are ways to cope and there are many different methods and there are many people out there that you can talk to. Just know that you're not alone and that you'll get through this. Here's another intriguing question for you. Which early ADHD treatment involved the use of stimulants, marking the beginning of pharmacological intervention? A. Caffeine pills. Pills containing caffeine, a stimulant found in coffee and tea. B. Benzedrine, amphetamine, an early stimulant medication used to treat symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsiveness. C. Cocaine drops, a medicinal use of cocaine in liquid form for various treatments. D. Herbal concoctions, mixtures of herbs used in traditional medicine for their supposed health benefits. Keep watching to discover the answer later in the video. A common myth is that people with ADHD are just lazy and unmotivated. This misconception fails to recognize the challenges that individuals with ADHD face in managing their symptoms. ADHD affects executive function, which includes skills like planning, organizing, and sustaining attention. These challenges can make it difficult for individuals to complete tasks that require prolonged focus and effort. Dr. Thomas E. Brown, a clinical psychologist, explains, people with ADHD often have difficulties with executive functions which are crucial for managing daily tasks. This does not mean they are lazy or lack motivation. In fact, many people with ADHD work harder to achieve the same results as those without the condition. This highlights the importance of understanding the neurological basis of ADHD and the effort required to manage its symptoms. ADHD can impact various areas of life, including education, work, and relationships. For example, students with ADHD may struggle with completing homework, staying organized, and following instructions. In the work- I just said to him, I was like, hey, just quick question. Has anyone te tested you for ADHD? And he's like, no. I'm like, it's interesting that you've spent this much time in therapy. And the first thing everyone has gone to is shame, but something nobody has considered. If you just look at some of these triggers, some of these things that you talk about, a lot of them can be attributed to something we understand. And so in the same way, people have started understanding autism, Asperger's and you know, all, all these, I feel like ADHD was one of the weirdest ones and it's still one of the stranger ones where people think, and so did I when I was young, that ADHD is, ah, yeah. ah, this kid can't pay attention, ah. When in fact, what it means is you are unable to control what you pay attention to. Mm. So generally when you have ADHD, you are paying more attention than most people, but to the wrong thing. Right, to Super Mario Bros. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, it can be like a, I can be in a in a classroom, this time I'm in school, I'm in a classroom, 
and there's like a little bird on, tapping at the window and the teacher's speaking. I'm, my brain is like, that bird is, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Most people are able to go, the bird is not consequential to what's happening right now. Turn it off. Yeah. Focus on the teacher. I, my brain sometimes goes, that bird, man. That bird. That bird is ridiculous. And I think many comedians have ADHD. I think many comedians become comedians and are good comedians because they have ADHD because it's such a perfect environment for ADHD and that you it have will, again it gets rewarded yeah it's it's but it's also it's like comedy is very distracting there's a lot of people in an audience it's a tightrope you can never you can never turn off you can never get lazy you can never become complacent it forces focus it really does it yeah. really does but it forces focus to the state of flow and it keeps you engaged and it pushes you and that's a perfect environment for a, for a comedian and it's a perfect environment rather for, for somebody with ADHD and so in that I'm talking to Gerard and I go like I, I'm not saying it is or it isn't but it's just weird that no one's considered this yeah. when you have the hallmarks the guy stopped to get a hot dog and then missed his friend's wedding it sounds a lot to me like ADHD which a lot of people can misinterpret as just being an asshole by the way but it is executive dysfunction and so when I when I think of these things and when I've learned what they mean for myself you know when I think of life and you, you talk about I go oh man it, it's 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 you think it's depression but then you realize that depression is oftentimes a symptom of something else you know and I, I hope we get to the point Point where we start understanding depression a little bit more because if we just keep saying to people you're depressed essentially what we're saying is you're long-term sad so we need to make you happy but it's like but what is making you depressed i find is more interesting and actually gets to the core place adults with adhd might find it challenging to meet deadlines manage time effectively and stay focused during meetings these difficulties are not due to laziness but are symptoms of the disorder it's crucial to provide appropriate support for individuals with adhd to help them succeed this can include accommodations in school or work, behavioural therapy and medication. By debunking the myth that people with ADHD are lazy, we can foster a more supportive and understanding environment. Recognising the effort that individuals with ADHD put into managing their symptoms can lead to greater empathy and better support cis. Thames, inequities in ADHD diagnosis and treatment are prevalent worldwide, influenced by race, ethnicity and socioeconomic status. In the United States, research published in Pediatrics highlights that black and Hispanic children are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD compared to their white peers, despite having similar symptom levels. This disparity is attributed to factors such as biases in the healthcare system and differences in access to care. The study found that only 4.4% of black children and 3% of Hispanic children were diagnosed with ADHD compared to 8.1% of white children. Globally, socioeconomic factors significantly impact the likelihood of receiving an ADHD diagnosis and appropriate treatment. A study in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health found that children from lower income for mile IS are less likely to receive a diagnosis and treatment for ADHD. Children in the lowest income bracket were 2.5 times less likely to be diagnosed compared to those in the highest income bracket. In Brazil, Dr. Ana Souza, a psychologist, notes that children from rural or low income areas face significant barriers to accessing ADHD diagnosis and treatment. The Brazilian Journal of Psychiatry reports that efforts are being made to improve access and reduce these disparities, but challenges remain due to limited resources and healthcare infrastructure. Understanding these global challenges is crucial for developing more equitable healthcare systems that can support all individuals with ADHD, regardless of their background. Addressing these inequities requires comprehensive policy changes, increased funding for mental health services, and widespread education to reduce stigma and improve awareness. Some retards. And girls who had it were just weird. I guess I was one of those weird girls. I was so daydreamy and clumsy. I once even rode my bike into the back of a parked car. And like a lot of girls with ADHD, I was anxious. And I didn't have a lot of good friends. And what always made it worse was there were so many people who just didn't take the trouble to understand what was going on with me, why I wasn't trying harder to fit in or not make so many mistakes because I was trying hard. Well, today many people will tell you that ADHD can be a gift. And I believe that up to a point. I would not trade my life with ADHD for a life without it. I think it's 
probably the source of a lot of the creativity I've shown in my work because the same lack of filters that has me blurting out things inappropriately has also led to a lot of good ideas. And I also credit ADHD for the intuition that has led me finally to a great group of friends and a husband I adore and even a psychiatrist who saved me from myself over and over again. But if I could go back and tell that weird girl just three things, they would be these. First, learn all you can about this double-edged gift you've been given because everyone has personal challenges. But this label gives you a map of your mind and an indication of all the tools that are out there. And that's great too. You're going to make a lot more mistakes than other people. Just deal with it because you can learn from everyone. Three, you're gonna have a harder time making and keeping good friends. But don't ever stop trying because the friends you make are gonna be worth all that effort. And I guess there's a fourth. Please remember to enjoy the ride. A common myth is that medication is the only way to treat ADHD. While medication can be an effective part of treatment, it is not the only option. ADHD can be managed through a combination of medication, behavioral therapies, lifestyle changes, and coping strategies. Medication, such as stimulants and non-stimulants, can help reduce symptoms of ADHD by improving focus, attention, and impulse C on troll. However, it is important to work with a healthcare provider to find the right medication and dosage. Behavioral therapies, including cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, can be very effective in helping individuals with ADHD develop coping S strategies and improve their organizational skills. CBT focuses on changing negative thought patterns and behaviors, which can help manage the symptoms of ADHD. Additionally, lifestyle changes such as regular exercise, a healthy diet, and sufficient sleep can significantly impact the management of ADHD symptoms. Exercise in particular has been shown to improve focus and reduce hyperactivity and impulsiveness. Coping strategies, such as using planners, setting reminders, and breaking tasks into smaller steps can help individuals with ADHD manage their daily irresponsibilities more effectively. It is important to recognize that each person with ADHD is unique and what works for one person may not work for another. Therefore, a comprehensive personalized approach to treatment is often the most effective. By understanding that medication is just one part of a multifaceted treatment plan, we can better support individuals with ADHD in finding the strategies that T work best for them. What I wish people knew about ADHD is that medication is not enough to treat it. It can make a huge difference. It did for me. I started taking medication when I was 12 and it was like putting on glasses for the first time and realizing I focus and wondering if this is what the world looked like to everybody else. And it made a huge difference, but it wasn't enough. And for 20 years, I went to psychiatrists month after month being asked, do you have any side effects? No. You know, is the medication working? Yes. Um, and thinking that was it and everything else was just my fault with some sort of character defect, you know, I was still messy. I was still disorganized. I was still, uh, you know, I, I didn't get back to my friends. I didn't, um, finish projects. I got fired from jobs and all of these things were happening that, that were still a real struggle for me. I was still really battling these challenges, but because I thought the medication was supposed to take care of that, I thought everything else was just me. So pills don't teach skills. We need skills too. I wish that that was what Throughout this video, we've debunked common myths about ADHD, shedding light on the reality of this complex condition. We've explored how ADHD is a real medically recognized disorder that affects both children and adults. ADHD is not caused by poor parenting, nor is it a sign of laziness or lack of motivation. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder with genetic and biological roots, requiring a comprehensive approach to management, including medication, behavioral therapy, eyes, lifestyle changes, and coping strategies. Remember the inspiring stories of individuals like Michael Phelps, Solange Knowles, Richard Bacon, and Will. I am who have achieved incredible success despite their ADHD. These examples show that with the right support and understanding, people with ADHD can thrive. Globally, experts like Dr. Ajit Bede in India, Dr. Wang Yufeng in China, Dr. Bola Adaronmu in Nigeria, and Dr. Naoki Higuchi in Japan are working to increase awareness and improve treatment for ADHD, highlighting this as a worldwide issue. Did you know that about 5% of the global population has ADHD? Studies from organizations like the World Federation of ADHD and the National Institute of Mental Health show the widespread impact of this condition. Have you or someone you know experienced the challenges of ADHD? What myths about ADHD have you encountered? Share your stories and thoughts in the comments below. 
Let's continue this important conversation and work together to spread awareness and combat misinformation. For more information, visit reputable sources like the ADHD Foundation in the UK, Chadi in the US, the ADHD Association of South Africa, and the Japanese ADHD Society. These organizations offer extensive resources and support for individuals with ADHD and their families. If you found this video helpful, please like it and subscribe to Proteon for more content on ADHD and other neurodevelopmental disorders. By subscribing, you join a community of people inspired to learn and be positive. Imagine a world where understanding and supporting neurodiversity is as common as any other aspect of health. How different would our communities and workplaces be if everyone embraced this mindset? Remember, you have the power to make a difference in someone's life by spreading awareness and understanding. Follow your passions, embrace your unique strengths, and always take care of yourself. Each step you take towards understanding ADHD helps create a more inclusive and supportive world for everyone. Hi again. You probably thought we didn't give the answers and were wondering, where are they? Well, I'm glad you stayed. Here are the answers to the quiz questions. For the first question, which unusual treatment was historically used for managing symptoms similar to ADHD before modern understanding? The correct answer is bloodletting. Fun fact, bloodletting was a common practice in ancient medicine and was believed to cure many ailments by balancing bodily fluids, though it was largely ineffective and often harmful. For the second question, which early ADHD treatment involved the use of stimulants, marking the beginning of pharmacological intervention? The correct answer is benzodrine amphetamine. Fun fact, benzodrine introduced in the 1930s was the first stimulant medication used to treat ADHD symptoms, and it paved the way for the development of other effective ADHD medications. Thank you for sticking around and participating in our quiz. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe to Proteon, and share it with others. Your engagement helps us create more content that spreads awareness and understanding of ADHD. Until next time, take care and keep learning with Proteon.